welcome back from lunch, and hopefully we're gonna provide you enough entertainment and content to keep you wide awake after all the food. So um, welcome to WRPC, Distributed Components, No Assembly Required. Um, we'll hopefully deliver on that promise throughout the, the whole uh, part of everything in the stock. So let's go ahead and introduce ourselves real quick. Hi, I'm Rowan, Principal Software Engineer at Cosmonic, uh, but Code Alliance Recognized Contributor. I have designed and built big parts of WRPC, have background in real-time globally distributed uh, systems, and for the last few years, I'm mostly focused on WebAssembly runtime, so mostly embedding wasm time and extending it in different ways. Taylor? Yeah, so I am an engineering director at Cosmonic, I'm also a Byte Code Alliance Recognized Contributor. Done a lot of stuff there. If you've been to any of the other talks throughout this conference, you'll have already seen that, so I'm not gonna rehash it too much. I am the CNCF WASM Working Group Co-Chair, um, along with a couple others who are also here at this conference. Um, and I am a serial open source contributor, particularly in the CNCF space. Those are some of the things listed there. Um, mainly a WASM cloud maintainer, and um, right now, and done a lot of uh, work on that. So let's go ahead and dive into the agenda. So like, what's the whole point? What are we gonna talk about here? I'm gonna start off with just a little bit of a story to kind of level set and show where, where some of this came from and where it emerged out of. And we're gonna talk a lot about extending WASM and why we have different pro, uh, why we have this new protocol we're talking about called WRPC. And then we're gonna show it in action. Most of this is gonna be demos after I do some explaining um, because we, I wanna make sure you understand the high level and then also see it at like in action with some lower level stuff. Roman is very much the expert here and will be showing that, um, but obviously, we're, we're both here because we both have experience with this. So let's talk a little bit about the history. So once upon a time, there was this oh so tiny little project called Wasm Cloud. Not actually that tiny. Um, we just moved to incubating. Um, so it's been a, around for five years. Um, but what we noticed is as we were doing this project, everybody wanted to do customizable things. And so that means that we, we couldn't just have a specific set of interfaces available. We had to say like, okay, we need something like WASI key value, a standard key value interface, and then a couple that we do for WASM Cloud, but then also, hey, I wanted to do something custom. And just as a brief reminder, a component inside, uh, inside of a component, everything's defined via WIT. So you would have something that looks, for example, something like this, and it has your um, like different things listed out. It has exactly what you're importing, what you're exporting out. And these things are generally provide, have to be provided by something. And so, um, like for example, if you have Postgres, that has to be provided by something called Postgres. Now we have the, this concept of something called providers. These are host extensions. We've called them providers because that's literally what they do. They provide a capability to something that is running. And so we have things like Postgres, but we also have built-in things that come from the host itself via WASM time. This is your standard, if you've probably, if you've attended the other sessions, you've probably seen at least one of these, something like WASI IO or WASI CLI or any of those kind of interfaces. Those things are, are built, by, built into the host. They're kind of a very, very standard low level layer. But we just noticed that pretty much anybody who was doing something serious with WebAssembly needed a custom, at least one custom interface. Um, in this case, that's kind of represented by like the Wasm Cloud Task Manager, but it could be anything. That's why we have like Acme Corp custom provider there. They always needed something. When, when a user came to us, they're like, hey, we need to do and insert their custom API. So beyond being customizable, and I'll explain why this is important even more later, but it needed to be distributed. A lot of these people wanted to run at a bare minimum inside of a Kubernetes cluster, but a lot of times it was across multiple Kubernetes clusters or on the edge and then back to a Kubernetes cluster or sometimes just edge devices. So we needed something that could work distributed as well. And that is where WRPC came out of, was just this us starting to solve this problem. But the thing is we knew we wouldn't be the only ones who needed to solve this problem. We needed to have some way to have basically anything custom because there's no way anyone can just always be building custom interfaces in. But that still begs the question, like, but why, why are you up here talking about a new protocol? There's all these other things that are out there. Like, why are you talking about this? Um, hence all the classic memes and, and GIFs here. So um, the real answer is WASM superpower is interface-driven development. Um, that the whole reason we have WIT is that it has these very concrete types, and I'll show some examples of this in a second, that let us define things in very specific ways, and we are able to use those interfaces whether we're exporting or importing them. So let's go over some whys about why we're doing this. The first and probably most important thing is around security and extensibility. Point number one here is that users should not need to build their own hosts to add in custom things. That's just a nightmare. 
Um, like if you have to always build your custom host for your custom thing, like there's no point, like that, that is a use case, by the way, I'm not saying it isn't, I'm saying, but if you're trying to do anything that's even somewhat general purpose, you don't want to have to build your host every time. But more importantly is embedding dependencies inside of hosts is a security nightmare. Imagine you throw in, let's use like the key value example. Let's say you throw in a val key or Redis or any of those kind of things and you have that client embedded in your host. What happens if, you're, if that Redis library has a security issue? Okay, well now you're building and rolling a whole new host. And also, if it's a memory issue, that now has access to all the memory that is inside of your host, meaning everything that's running. You have now violated your sandbox. Um, so embedding dependencies is something that should be done with great care. Now let's talk about that question though, like how can we then securely extend a trusted host? There's three main things that have been tried and kind of boiled down to. The first thing is a built-in plugin, which is what I was just explaining, these built-in embedded dependencies. Then you have dynamic libraries as in dilibs or shared objects, those kind of things. And then you have RPC style plugins, which is what WRPC falls under. So let's talk over a few different trade-offs and things that go around here. First off, communication overhead. Obviously, your least amount of communication overhead, meaning basically none, is if you build in your plugins. Because, uh, I mean, that should be self-evident. Um, but the dynamic libraries, that's a little bit bigger, but not much bigger. It depends on who you ask, and I'm not gonna open that can of worms here, about like the overhead of loading and doing things with dynamic libraries, but it is still much smaller than doing something like an RPC style plugin. And obviously RPC style plugins have a communication overhead, even if they're local, that's just the name of the game. But let's start talking about the other things. Um, are things not built into the host and runtime, meaning we're avoiding that dependency issue. Built-in plugins is a big no. It's not, like, if you've embedded that, it is now part of your runtime. Dynamic libraries, obviously, they're separate, so they're loaded in dynamically. They're not part of your dependency tree. You could technically swap them out. And then RPC style plugins, same thing. Those can be swapped out. Now, this one's the kicker. The most important of, of all of these points around security is once again around the sandboxing. Is it a sandbox process? Built-in plugins, no. Once again, the Redis library has an issue, your memory is, and it has something with memory, you're, you're kaput. They just popped the whole thing. Um, dynamic libraries, same problem. Once you load a dynamic library, it is running in the same memory space, the same process space as the rest of your things. And so you have now, added that as trusted code. If there is a security issue, once again, it has access to all of the same memory, all of the same problems, and everything else that process has access to. That is not a way you keep something sandboxed. RPC style plugins, on the other hand, can be run anywhere. They can be run um, in another OS process. They could be run in C groups. You could use a container to do that. You could run it in something like uh, Microsoft announced like Hyperlight. Um, that's, a, that's a good tool for this. You could do it in Firecracker. Any of those kind of tools are great for isolating these processes, but they are external to your actual host process, specifically because you cannot share memories. It does not violate the sandboxing. The, if something happens with that plugin, the maximum issue you're gonna have is that that interface is compromised. It can only do the things across the interface that it has been designed to do, and that just comes from it being WebAssembly. And then one of the last things here is, what's the DevX and operational experience of it? Built-in plug-in stuff, once again, even if it's just a, a standard update, I need a new feature, well, I now have to roll a host, and I have to roll out a host to somebody. And if that host is running on Kubernetes, then okay, then I'm gonna have to go update that on Kubernetes as well, or I'm gonna have to, that's, uh, that's a whole, that's not a great operational experience. Dynamic libraries, I mean, you can write one in Go, it's not the bestest experience, and, and as we all know, and I say this as someone who's written lots of Go code, Go, co go developers are allergic to C. So, like, th they're not gonna go write necessarily shared libraries off of that, and good luck doing that in Python or another language. You can, once again, there's always a way. We're, we're engineers, but that's not a great developer experience. With an RPC-style plugin, you can pretty much do that in any type of language. Um, and that's a lot nicer experience, and you can use all the other same type of generation tools that we use for the rest of Wasm. And so that's the whole point of what we're doing here. Now once again, just to call this out, that doesn't mean you should never do a built-in plugin. There are obvious use cases to do that. But it should be very, very specific and purpose-built and have generally code that you entirely own and or trust. Um, that should, it should be very, very specific for that because there are certain high efficiency workloads where you just have to embed those kind of things in. 
but for general purpose, things that are trying to be general purpose, embedding in dependencies or loading dynamic libraries is going to open up a whole bunch of security uh, worms, uh, security cans worms. So we'll just say that. Now, the other thing is that WIT is pretty powerful. Um, so we talked about the security thing. So these next two points are more like extra benefits here. So WIT is an extremely powerful thing. Roman's gonna show a really concrete example of, of this compared to other like RPC framework type things in a little bit. But in WIT, you can do things like right here. So this is a secrets interface. This is one that we started in Wasm Cloud where we're in the process of getting it upstreamed into the, the main WASI config uh, interface. But you have a, a, an opaque handle, as you see here, that's called secret. This can be containing PII, passwords, who knows what but it is a separate opaque handle that can then be passed around and then on the reveal, in that reveal function, something can then reveal it to use its data. So you're able to tune these kind of, you can't express that with things like open API or, or a proto buffs or any of those kind of things. That, that level of expression requires a lot of extra work. Um, additional like example of this is you have like middleware handling. Inside of WASI HTTP, your headers and your body are resources. And so if you're doing something with the headers as the middleware, you can grab that. You do nothing with that resource handle with the body and just pass that handle on. Those things are very hard to express in any other type of, of language or IDL. So the other thing here is I want, I, it's a bold claim. This isn't reinventing the wheel. And why is it not reinventing the wheel? Because we're using all the same standards. Component model already has a standard encoding and there's also the core WASM encoding. And that's already very, very compact, very efficient, and very straightforward um, to, uh, to know that it is going, sorry, very straightforward, meaning like it's very straightforward to understand that it is very small. Um, and like we already do that, why would you use that and then serialize it again to another thing? Um, you can just get these cross-language APIs for free because we're using WIT, we're using the same tool chains that everyone else, else does for the WebAssembly's community. Like that's what WRPC is supposed to do. So that's enough of me talking. That's the high level, but I really want, R Roman did a lot of the initial work here and he and a bunch of the other people in the community have done a ton of work around this space. And so we just wanna go ahead and show this off. So I'm gonna let Roman drive this here because uh, the demo is really gonna show why this is so important and how powerful it is. Right, thanks Taylor. <clears throat> so now let's see WRPC in action. So we'll start with a simple server. It's going to be a Rust server. And it's going to be a web server. It's going to serve some web app to the browser. Um, this is our web app right here. And we're going to be dealing with WASI key value. So I'll quickly just show that interface if you're not familiar with it. So we're going to be using a bucket resource. We're going to be able to open it from our browser. And then we're going to be able to also get and set some key. The normal things we would expect from a key value interface. So, Apart from just serving that web page, um, the server will also acts as a plugin for WRPC. So it will connect to Redis, and in terms of that Redis connection, it will export YZ key value using WRPC over Web Transport. So my web app is going to then import that WASI key value using web transport, just in pure JavaScript. There's no WebAssembly here actually in a web app. And it's going to be able to well, write to that Redis database. So let's see how that works. So I have selected Redis here as the target. And so let's say we set some key wasmcon to Redis, right? And I do a set right here. Now I can do a get. Of course, that could be just all staged here. So let's uh, open a Redis CLI and uh, do the keys. So we have wasmcon key, and if we get wasmcon, we get Redis. Similarly, I can set wasmcon to, I don't know, foo or something like that. And if I do get, I get foo, right? So I'm now able to use the wasi key value from my browser and just you know, directly interact with my um, database through the server plugin. But let's take it a bit step further, right? And so now let's have a native Go WBC plugin, which again is going to export WASI key value. This time is going to have an in-memory implementation, is going to use nas.io as a transport. So my server now becomes a proxy. So it will export WASI key value to my web app, but it's also going to import WASI key value from that native Go plugin over nas.io as a transport. So I'll do a Go run of my plugin in Go. See, I use Go to do that. Uh, since this is NATS, I have to select a little prefix here to you know, differentiate between different services there. And let's say I set you know, go. And if I do a get, I get go, right? It all just works again. As you can see here, these are the invocations that were served by my plugin. They just arrived from a, you know, through the proxy, and it all just worked. So as a next step, 
I'll take a WebAssembly component, which actually exports WASI key value, right? Just using Bitbench and just, just general bytecode analyzed tooling. And I'll run it in WRPC WASM time, which is a small um, WASM time embedding provided by WRPC. I'll go into detail more later about it. And uh, yeah, I'll also use that from my browser. And I'll use TCP as a transport. Um, I'll start my component. Uh, let me just quickly, here we go. I already have compiled it, so I just need to, uh, oh, sorry. Need to serve for this one. So these are all the methods you would expect. This is from the bucket, right, that you're serving right here. And so now, let's set our key to, let's say, wasm. And if I do a get, I get wasm. And again, this is all, like these are the logs for my component. So you can see here it was serving these invocations which can arrive through the proxy from the web app to my component and then given to it through the you know, embedding to the actual component. And now finally, I would also like to show you a native Rust WPC plugin. However, I have a little problem in that we just have too many transports implemented and this would take too much time to show you all of them. So perhaps I'll get a suggestion of which transport you'd like to see. We have quick, Unix domain sockets, web transport, TCP, or nest.io. TCP, okay, TCP, fair enough. Um, it will be <laughs> kind of similar, so. By the way, all these examples are available in WPC repository, so you can try these yourself as well. So um, this particular one is WASI key value TCP server. Effectively, like, that uh, term there is the transport. So now again, well, it will use the same <laughs> uh, address. So let's say we use Rust for this one, right? And again, we can, oh. Let me just try to reconnect this one. Oh, here we go. Um, so again, it served my uh, you know, applications right here. So we keep talking about these WPC transports, but so what is a transport? In WPC, transport is just a bidirectional multiplex by stream. And if your stream is not multiplex, that's not a problem because WPC can provide framing and multiplex it for you. Effectively, what it means that if you have something that can read bytes and write bytes, you got yourself a transport. In Go, it would be IO read writer. In Rust, it would be something like async read and async write. And so, in result, these transports can be actually very, very simple and short. Like, for example, the TCP transport you've seen before, which has 114 lines of code. Um, but why do we need the multiplexing? Why do we actually care about that? Well, that's because WRPC is designed from ground up for async. It's at its core, um, you know, asynchronous protocol. It's not an afterthought added to the protocol later. So why do we need streaming? Well, streaming is crucial for network applications, right? It less is the real-time data processing so we can you know, operate on data as it comes in and perhaps also stream it out, you know, doing something with it. It provides better resource utilization, scalability, and of course, better performance. Um, and the way we do that is by having full support for future and stream types in WRPC. That support is aligned with the latest Commode model specification draft, and we have support for in Go and Rust function for it. So who needs async? If you want to build scalable applications, it's you. You, need, you is who needs async. Um, so let's see an example of a use case of async in some, say, other, other RPC protocols like gRPC. So if you wanted to have a streaming hash function, which takes in stream of bytes and then returns a stream of bytes, we would need to define a message we would come in, right? Because it's, we can only have one parameter, of course, that's function, gRPC, and protobuf. So we would have, let's say, a uh, string parameter as algorithm and format, and a chunk, which would be arriving you know, as part of the stream. We'd also have to define a request, of course, message for you know, streaming bytes out. And note how, for, for this interface, of course, there are many ways how we could express this interface. But uh, if, like for, the, for this example, right, um, algorithm and format strings, they would, like what is, how do you handle it? What, what if you get two messages on the stream and let's say have different algorithm or they have, you know, maybe the first message didn't have an algorithm set, right? There's a lot of complexity here, which kind of seems trivial for this example, but generally the implementation must handle this complexity because of the lack of expressiveness of the IDL. With WIT and WRPC, we can express this function as just a single line of code, it's a single function. We have a single algorithm parameter, a single format parameter, and we have a stream of bytes, right? These are native uh, async types. And so this expressiveness lets us shift that complexity from implementation to the contract and tooling, the, you know, the, the, the generator, the, the binding generator. So how do we actually handle async in WRPC? So we have this concept of a structural asynchronous path. Okay, and so um, that's where the multiplexing comes in because we can uh, effectively index 
multiple data channels on top of the SQL byte stream using this async path. So for each invocation, there's always going to be a synchronous parameter channel and result channel. So for example, for our hash function, the algorithm string and the format string would always arrive synchronously. Like the, the invoker would always immediately in, in, encode all of that and send one big you know, invocation with these parameters. Similarly, the server would immediately encode the result with us, okay, success or a failure. That'll be immediately sent back. But then the streams on both sides could be sent asynchronously later in chunks, right? And in order to, well, split, <laughs> let's say, the, the stream we get in, we use this, this path. So with that, small aside on the wire protocol that we see. As we said, we follow the standards. So this is just component model value encoding, which is largely based, based on core WASM encoding and canonical ABI. In some sense, you can think about it as a packed canonical ABI representation. So let's say false is just zero, just like in canonical ABI. Same for true, for, for, you know, for Booleans. <laughs> Um, a string is encoded as a name in core WASM, so it's length prefix UTF encoded, uh, UTF-8 encoded string, and the length is variable size integer like 128 encoded. So with that, let's take a you know, let's take a look at the framing and how the actually vacations work. Again, framing is actually optional, but most transports would obviously use this this um, this, this framing. So an invocation contains a version string. It starts with the you know, version byte, I'm sorry. Uh, for now, it's just a zero because it's the first version of the protocol. So now it's followed by um, instance, encode as core wasm name, uh, function, core wasm name, and then zero or more frames. A frame can, impress, can be expressed in width as a record of two fields. Here's a path followed by data. Right, so it's uh, is that description as path we've just seen before, which is just zero for uh, empty, effectively for uh, synchronous parameters, and otherwise it's some asynchronous path. So an example of this could be seen is wasm key value store open. Let's say we want to just pass a string wasm to our call. Right, so we'll start with that byte of zero, which is the version, we follow by 13 bytes of wasm key value store instance, four bytes of open, then zero is the path because we only have synchronous parameters here. And finally, we have a chunk of so length of five, and then you see you know, four for the wasm. So this is a very small and compact representation of single vacation, which even fits on this one slide. So the title of this talk was WPC Distributed Components, right? No assembly required. So let's deliver on that promise. And so to do that, I'll actually right now create right here on the stage a new completely, you know, two components and two interfaces well, one interface, and uh, you know, it will always be custom. So I'll use Cargo Generate, I'll use a template provided by WBC organization to generate a new project. We are at WasmCon, so I'll call it WasmCon, if I type it right. Here we go, and I'll also call the same my package name, so WasmCon. So at this point, as you know, naming is really, really hard. So could I just suggestion for a package name to use, perhaps? Maybe, we told them. Shout a name, any. Foo? Blue. All right, let's do blue. What about the interface name? Green. Green. That's <laughs> great. That's very Someone's creative. Thinking deploys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry. I just need to type right. Um, okay. So let's see what we have here. Um, yeah. Here we go. So it's a Rust workspace. Workspace with two components. One is a command component. One is a reactor component. And we have here width generated. So I'll make a build. You know of these components, and while it's happening, let's take a look at the width we have just generated. So we have our wasm.com blue, <laughs> interface green, and in the green we have function greet. Greet takes in a name, returns a string, right? It picks in a string, turns a string. It gives us a greeting. Um, the implementation of this is pretty simple. We have a server right here, which uh, you know, gets a string, returns hello, comma, name, and explanation mark. Similarly, my client will be able to import greet with the string demo, and then it will just print uh, greeting to start out. So at this point, I have my component built. Um, so I have, just to show that I'm not cheating here, and this, you know, it's all really happening here. So I have wasm time version 26, right? And if I tried to you know, run this component in um, my client components in wasm time, it will fail, right? And, and rightfully so, it should fail, right? Because wasm time should not export wasm.com blue green. It, it would be pretty weird if it did. So if I used WBC wasm time now and I did a run of the same component, let me just quickly check it. All right. This also fails. And if you're familiar with wasm time, you'll notice that previously my component failed to instantiate. 
Now it actually was instantiated, but it failed at runtime, well, because there was no plugin actually providing this export, right? So it failed to fulfill this, um, you know, this contract or TCP. So let's fix that. Oh, I actually have one already. So let me just close this one. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to serve my uh, plugin, the server.wasm, which will give me the greeting. And so now if I run it, I get hello demo, right? Because now I have this TCP thing running on the other side, and it actually provides me with the implementation of this interface. It, I can arbitrarily stop my plugin and run it again, and it all still work, just because, well, it's all working over TCP. Um, yeah, so how, how did that actually all happen? Like, <laughs> I did not ahead of time know, you know what, what was going to be the name of the interface, right? So each component in itself contains WebAssembly interface types, right? It's all, like, by definition, it's, it's all there already. So that WPC wasn't time runtime we talked about before briefly. Uh, it will effectively iterate or all imports and exports your component, and it will polyfill all imports, which are not already provided by wasm time, for example, like wasi IO streaming or wasi clocks and things like that. And on reverse of that, for every export your component has, it will also set up effectively an endpoint that can be invoked using WRPC. And then at runtime, you can actually choose any transport you want to invoke these things. Right, so we introspect the component type. And by just looking at the component type, we have all the signatures, we have all the information we need to actually turn that into an RPC. Um, so if you're interested in any of this, then please uh, try it out. There are plenty of examples in Go and Rust particularly. We are open to any kind of contributions, no matter, no matter how big or small. And with that, back to you, Taylor. Yeah, so there's some key takeaways here. Obviously, they're up here on, on the screen. But um, I just want to reiterate what you just saw. So Roman just showed you multiple different, essentially, host plugins, host extensions written in different languages. Um, using various protocols that can all be used as the underlying transport. So all of these things can be used to assemble a very powerful platform. So these are transport agnostic, and you get completely arbitrary, custom, um, arbitrary and custom interface support inside of a host without actual static bindings in there. You don't have to statically compile in these things. And it works just like comp uh, component composition, but at runtime. So this is a much, uh, a very powerful way to do these things without uh, wading into those security issues I was talking about, and it's very good for general purpose. There's no way we're going to be able to continue iterating over WASM um, and adding new interfaces, ones that are both common like WASI interfaces and then ones that are custom to each and every company that's doing things without the ability to easily test and add these things on. And that is exactly what all of this does because that was the thing there at the end. Like, I, he, wa he wasn't joking. Like, I, I still, my jaw, I've, I've known about this stuff for months, but um, his, my jaw dropped when he first showed me this demo of just like whipping out a new interface just live right in front of you. That wasn't, that wasn't canned. That was something that is something that you can just go pull and start working on an interface and then be able to start using that interface just like you'd expect. Um, there was no special things for the wit. There was no, it, it was just all standard tooling like we were trying to promise here, this is no assembly required. You just bring the wit that you're ex you normally expect and then have it work. And so that's what, we're really, what we really wanted to show off here. And just as Rowan mentioned, there's some next steps to try here. Um, the first thing is try out these examples if you wanna give it a whirl. Um, this, like I said, this is a way you can do um, isolation, and I know that's a common thing I've heard from a lot of people. Um, then you can also try creating your own implementation of an existing interface. We have things like any of the WASI cloud interfaces, WASI key value, WASI blob store, and you can try building those with WRPC. You can also um, file issues and bugs, pick an interface to do that with or whatever you need to. And then also, if you want to learn more about this, Roman will be available at the WASI cloud contrib fest um, uh, that's on Thursday. Um, it's one of the, the normal contrib fest that's going on. And so you can come there. If you're like really interested in this, you can come and try this out and build it, and Roman will be there and available. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, thank you for that. There's the uh, QR code to the WRPC repo if you're interested, and then we have some time for questions. So I was just curious on your example there where you generated the blue and green thing. Um, did you define the transport, like TCP or, or anything? Or was it, I, I, I guess I just didn't understand that. Right, yeah, so I actually, so it's a parameter to WPC wasn't time. So you see here I have uh, TCP on, on both sides, 
hopefully it's big enough to see. But let's say I can also change it to, say, NATS, right? So NATS is that thing that uh, we use at Awesome Cloud, right? So if I do that, if I serve and I run, again, I get hello demo. So I can, you know, I can choose at runtime what transport I actually want to use for this. Um, so what's the story with like uh, interface evolution and is it, can you do that in like a loosely coupled way or do you have to have like an exact match between the client and the server? Um, is there like a default value that you could use for stuff, for instance? Except could, could you repeat the first part of your question? Um, so I'm just thinking of it from like a gRPC perspective where mm -hmm. like, you know, um, the server interface might evolve, they might add stuff to the requests, they might add stuff to the responses and like, um, clients and servers are supposed to handle that, like they're not supposed to upgrade the client at the same time as they upgrade the server, right? Um, is there any kind of like work going on for WRPC for that kind of stuff? Right, so if, if I was like question correctly, so the, the assumption is that um, both peers, they share the width, right? So all the interfaces defined in there. Now, um, things you can do though, however, like let's say, Effectively, we, we follow whatever is done in the spec. Like, however, like, we, gotta, we try to do similar things like, say, WasmType does in terms of you know, semantic version and you know, compatibility of interfaces. Right? So one thing we can do with NATS, is let's say we actually we just did it in WasmCloud as well. So we changed the version of our Blob Store interface, but we're actually in the client, we can first check, oh, is, the fir is, is, a new, is a recent version available? If yes, just use that, and otherwise fall back to the previous version. So that's how, let's say, we do it in, with NAS. Yeah, and, and, and WIT itself, it's really important to note that WIT has this built in. Um, was that you who did a lot of that work, Joel? I can't remember. But there's a couple of people in here um, who actually <laughs> did the work on this, but they made it so that you can do, there's an, uh, an annotation. You can say it's unstable or it's since. And you're able to be, as long as you're following Semver, you can add new features without breaking, and those things can be compatible. The other thing, because people always then ask the question, like, well, how are you gonna avoid all the same problems is like what has been done in the past with this. So the whole point of why they're called components is because they can be composed. And so when you release a new version of a, an interface, I'm thinking it's gonna be pretty likely to release that alongside with an adapter, if it's possible. Sometimes it won't be possible, but you should be able to do like, if we go and we move this interface from 010 to 020, we could create an adapter that, pull, that can adapt it from 010 to 020. So when those are composed together, for all intents and purposes, that component is either importing or exporting that new thing that you just composed on top of it. One sec, I'll come back. Uh, so if I want the transport to be like authenticated or encrypted, uh, is that as simple as it seems that you would just like swap out the transport for something that's implemented in that way? And, and if, if so, do you have like examples of, of doing that? Right, so like I said, like transport is really just a byte stream. So effectively, um, there's no currently anything to do that, but it would be very easy to add. Like you, you can extend these um, transports, you know, sky is the limit, right? You could, you could build a kind of middleware here, you could uh, encode the width and then decode on the other side, right? You can um, compress it, et cetera. Yeah, for what it's worth, Wasm Cloud is using, like we've mentioned, the NATS one underneath the hood, so it's using WRPC for all of its communications. Um, so like, this isn't just a toy, like people are using it inside of Wasm Cloud right now, and that one uses TLS and all the other stuff you'd expect underneath the hood. So we're using like the decentralized NATS authentication, TLS, all the stuff you'd expect to see in a production cluster you can do on that. So it's just more about the actual transport information and configuring that transport. The WRPC part stays the same, no matter what the transport is. And of course, like quick and web transport are already natively encoded. They only work with TLS, so they are already are encrypted. It's all already sorry, encrypted. Yeah. It's just that I, in, in the examples, uh, they we just you know we don't verify a server certificate just just for the sake of simplicity, but uh, it's you know just regular TLS. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess in terms of usage here, I think most people would just be embedding some sort of WRPC um, W. Um, RPC into their own projects. Um, you have here running with WRPC Wasm Time, something that will be, I guess, maintained, or is this contributed upstream to Wasm Time itself? I guess what do you see the plans being there? So currently, the way it's structured, there are multiple. There are multiple actually crates you could use to to, to benefit from WRPC. It's very modular, so you don't actually even need to pull in all of it, right? So there is, for example, WRPC runtime Wasm Time. So that's integration for Wasm Time to use WRPC. If you want to use it, you can use it. That's what they use here for this binary. You don't need to use it, right? There's also just WPC transport on itself, which is very minimal. There's only 
effectively just all built on Tokyo. So there's like TCP and Unix sockets, nothing else. There's a separate crate for a quick transport, a separate web transport crate, et cetera. Right, so it's all very modular. And it's actually, like Wasm Cloud, for example, also used these crates to build on top of. So it is meant to be as these kind of building blocks you put together, very composable, and build your own thing. Yeah, and future plan really is to get this embedded into all the different Wasm time things. Right now, like, don't be freaked out by the fact that it's WRPC Wasm time. It's literally all the same stuff in like the Wasm time CLI. It's the same embeddings. It just has the wrapper around it to do the polyfilling part, and then start up, start listening or doing the call across WR, WRPC. So the, that's what the future is going to look like with what we're hoping it should look like here is that trying to get that integrated in pretty much everywhere. But like this is entirely, this is entirely in the Bytecode Alliance. It's part of, it's a project there. Um, and so we're, we're just looking for that like an additional work to you know, integrate it in. Um, this was part of the reason we wanted to give this talk is so people could see it in action and know what was up. So with that, I think we're at time. We're gonna be available to have answer more questions if you'd like. So thank you very much for coming. Have a good rest of your day.